Good morning, Minecrafters, and welcome to Season 2, Episode 10, and my codependent, a continuation of the discussion. So, last week, we talked about, um, you know, sort of got started with talking about different ways to be codependent, and we really kind of zoomed on on the, on the caretaker. This is so common. So, it doesn't mean... You know, anybody who caretakes is obviously codependent. Taking care of each other is a good thing. We're talking about when it's mindless giving and for approval seeking and really to fill ourselves up with that approval of, you know, um, sort of more compulsively rescuing people. Uh, and it, it gets in the way of our mental health. And we talked episodes and episodes ago about the difference between mindful giving and mind less giving. Mind full giving really almost, you know, gives us, not almost gives us energy. Mindful giving, mindful giving, giving gives us energy. Whereas mind less giving really depletes us. And not to be confused or, or coerced into believing that um, this compulsive caretaking charges us. That, that temporary charge with codependency is addiction because codependency is addiction. Codependents are people junkies or relationship junkies and get filled up and over the top by being human doings in some way. And codependency is so, so, so common. They remember the idea is not to say, oh no, you know, something more is wrong with me still. It's about awareness, awareness of what is just isn't working for us anymore. And then, of course, making wanting to make that change. Uh, so last week, I would definitely encourage you, if you're listening now and you didn't listen to the first one, I would definitely encourage you to go back. Because even though it was you know, specifically the caretaker for the most part, it was really kind of the foundation for this whole discussion about that person who's running around overcommitted, getting all kinds of feel-good, addicted stuff from uh, being a human doing, hurried and bustled and, and just running around exhausted and then becoming resentful that people aren't appreciated appreciating them basically. And so here's the deal. I mean, obviously the codependent, you know, personality is coming from more than likely a home that was extremely dysfunctional because these behaviors are learned. And remember that thoughts come first, feelings second, and our actions or behaviors are last. And so cognitively speaking, the little child inside of you learned behaviors to survive a crazy chaotic household so it's very very important to again become you know sort of come into this awareness come into this awareness yet with compassion for yourself gentle kindness and hopefully a lack of judgment because you know you were a two-year-old three-year-old four-year-old seven-year-old 15-year-old trying just trying to survive and uh, we are going to work on the setting free part but of course we got to first cover this is such a big topic. And I, I've taught it in the past for addictions classes um, when I, at the Community College of Vermont, actually. And I would say to students in those, uh, those are three hour long classes. I would say, you know, we really could do a whole semester just on codependency because it's that big of a topic. And typically most codependents are coming from a place of very low self-worth and not always aware that sometimes they are there's very little value for herself or himself and this 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 runs deep this is coming from the vault you know messages unconscious messages um from being very very little kids and then reinforced all the way up through because we we actively seek out being treated the way we're comfortable with and so that rolls right through teenagerhood um you know, typically it might be a young girl looking for love in all the wrong places, right? This can also be a boy looking for love in all the wrong places and seeking out, <clears throat> you know, confirmation for the messages that went into the hard drive early on. And last week, last week we talked about Melody Beatty's book, Codependent No More, and it's an oldie but a goodie. I would strongly suggest uh, grabbing a copy of this if you think, <clears throat> you know, this is your path because... She is spot on. <clears throat> and, you know, uh, it's funny because she talks about, you know, the low self-worth and that this, you know, now adult trying to 
do an archaeological dig, right? Because that is what we're doing. And I personally believe, you know, that's kind of what our 40s and 50s are for. And 50s are great, I'll tell you that, um, especially for women. I've never been a man, so I can't tell you that. But 50s for women are fabulous, the fabulous 50s. And it's kind of like we come into our own. And it's interesting because Melody talks about uh, often – you know, the codependent coming from these really dysfunctional families and often denying that their family was repressed and dysfunctional and troubled or whoever word you want to fill in there. And maybe that's true for a lot of people. I, I just remember, even as a kid, I was well aware that my family was dysfunctional. Um, and, but, you know, back then everything was so hush hush. You know, even I grew up in, in uh, New York, about an hour out of Manhattan and you know, neighborhood, and, you know, uh, and I, I don't know how the whole neighborhood didn't know what was going on. They probably did, but nobody ever talked about it. Uh, Melody also, she talked about how codependence from out the low self-worth category, which kind of broadly goes over, you know, the different ways that uh, codependency can manifest, right? So codependence can, can often pick at themselves and outwardly, you know, there I go again and, you know, you know, kind of overtly self-deprecating, as we would say, often have difficulty reje uh, with compliments, often will kind of break eye contact if somebody says something genuinely, you know, good about you, any kind of praise. And <clears throat> then, ironically, there's, there's a lot of irony with codependence because you can go every which way but loose. Can, they can get depressed from a lack of compliments and praise. And often, this is, a, this is one... Um, that overlaps because there's one coming, not right away. We got to break into some um, positive psychology stuff after the codependency chat. But uh, eventually, or and eventually, I'm going to get to the talk about adult children and alcoholics because there's just so much overlap here. So much overlap. Um, because the adult children and alcoholics, again, also become codependent. And we often just feel different from the rest of the world. I'm not talking about, you know, labels like my ADHD or whatever, you know, whoever's labeled with whatever. I mean, leaving that aside, even just as a, as a kid, as a teenager, as a young adult, seasoned adult, as an, as an adult child of two alcoholic parents, myself, you do, you just walk around feeling different, like the world's spinning with everybody doing what they're doing. And, I, and I'm different than all than them. And I, you know, I felt that way for years until I came into this awareness of why I felt so different. You can't, even, you can't even put your finger on it. And it's just this inherent feeling separated from the human race or something. It's, it's very difficult to describe, I think, unless you've actually been through it. And codependents often just feel that they're just not enough. You know, there's a lot of talk about that in 2020 for a variety of reasons, right? Just not feeling quite good enough and again, not being able to put a finger on it, handle on it, touch it, it's not tangible, it's because it's in the vault. And, you know, that's how I refer to the unconscious mind, um, which, of course, Freud discovered. And though people can have a lot to say about Freud, various different things, um, no matter what people can say about Freud, I don't know how anyone can ever take away the fact that he discovered the power of the unconscious mind because... When it comes right down to it, the unconscious mind is what's driving the bus. And, you know, as far as the unconscious being so at work, we have we have so little idea of where a lot of our, our thoughts, feelings, and behavior are coming from because so much of it is coming from that hard drive, which can make our um, seasoned adult, eventually midlife adults, I know a lot of my listeners are in the 23 to 44 range, and also then 44 up in the 50s, mo most of you. So it's like the whole range there because I do check. And this archaeological dig, it can make it tougher when, when so much of it is unconscious yet. Again, if we shift, change our words like we, like we discussed in the positive uh, stress mindset episode, instead of, wow, this is hard, wow, isn't this exciting? I'm on an arche archaeological dig of myself. What could be more thrilling than that? And just reminding that these traits, characteristics, I don't really like the word symptoms. I guess it's just played out. But remember that because this is so common, you might say, well, I don't have that, I don't have that. Wow, I have that, that, and that. So codependency is such a broad, broad, um, you know, phrase. And it's, again, it's really coming from this, this dysfunctional place where we learned 
to latch on to con- definitely to control. There, there's a we're going to get to that again. Um, right now we're on we're focused on the the low self worth piece specifically. So the codependent who's kind of locked into that low self worth thing has big rejection sensitivity, which can also be other things. It's kind of like I'll make a metaphor to Lyme disease, kind of related but unrelated, because that can mask depression, that can mask this, that can mask that. So rejection sensitivity uh, also can go along with ADHD and other things. And again, we're going to have overlap here because why human beings can't really be put into separate little boxes. So, you know, me for my ADHD, with my ADHD, for example, actually, truthfully, I don't really have a lot of rejection sensitivity, but it, it's, it can be there for a lot of people. I don't really know why. And the thing is overlap, 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 right? Because dysfunctional home, I grew up with two alcoholics. It's no big surprise when someone surfaces with ADHD that there is a background of an of addiction. It doesn't have to be you, but if they if you go digging back in your family, it's no big surprise that that's there. Then we're talking about codependency, which is you know a form of addiction, and so we'll get right back to how there's all this overlap. So codependents often fear rejection, and they often are really good at taking things personally taking it right into the living room. You know, it can't be this. It can't be that the so-and-so cell phone died. It has to be they want to break up with me. You know, that kind of thing. Take things more personally than someone who's not codependent, I guess, put it that way. And some codependents, this is often a stereotypical one, are really into being victims. So if you're having that awareness right now with yourself, I would, I would suggest, again, not to shame yourself. Oh, no, that's me, because that's, that's just victimizing too, right? Really, uh, what being, being a victim is about is just giving up your power on a silver platter, like with all kinds of beautiful garnishes around it. Just here you go, have a feast. Being a victim is just coming from this place of um, disempowerment. And I'm, I'm thinking of actually something Dr. Phil said years ago, I, though I haven't watched him in a couple decades, not for any reason, I'm just, you know, moving around. He said something that, that really struck me way back when, I was probably in my 30s, I don't even know. He said, you know, we don't, this is so basic, we don't continue to do things unless there's payoff in it for us. And it was some show with with a, some uh, couple people on there, he's trying to, you know, help them with their archaeological dig. And he just kind of maneuvered around and said, okay, now what about that is working for you? And it, it doesn't mean that it's something healthy, okay? Healthy things can work for us too. Unhealthy things can have tremendous payoff. Let's just say drinking is a kind of a simple example. We don't drink because it doesn't feel good, right? I mean, it's working on some level for us, bringing down anxiety, reducing, you know, all that from the end of the day. And obviously that doesn't work in the long run, you know, but as far as, you know, emotionally, you know, being a victim works for people. They get attention and they and they suck approval from everybody around them. And it's draining and depleting for everybody around you. And it charges you temporarily. Though really, when we're locked into victim mode, uh, that really kind of just beats up our self-worth because we're just reinforcing that we're not valuable. So, you know, a classic example of this, you know, thinking way back when I was therapizing and I didn't have too many, I didn't take, I usually worked with kids and with, I really wasn't too much of uh, that codependent person. When you work in an agency, you get everybody. And I was thinking of, I'm thinking right now of one particular woman, though there were a bunch who were just classic poster adults for codependency. And, you know, this one came in and she, black eye and, you know, she had rub, or hurt her rib and it was because her boyfriend, her husband, I forget, had knocked her around. And and she she was just so, I can't, it's hard to describe when she was kind of telling her story in the session. And it was just, you know, poor me, pity party, pity party, pity party. She was so locked into that. Feel bad. Let's just call her Susan. Susan getting beat up. Feel bad for her. What can we do for you? When in reality... And I'm not saying not to be kind. Of course, be kind always. The thing is, Susan was going to continue to allow, and the word is allow, someone to knock her around until Susan, you know, would eventually come into this place 
of valuing herself and sending this loser packet, right? And until that point when she actually arrives there, she'll break up with him and somebody shows up in a different outfit. She wonders why she's being hit yet again and again and again. And that can go on for, for years until people, you know, kind of realize the, the source is that she is, it's working for her. Like Dr. Phil, there's, Dr. Phil would say there's payoff in it. She is receiving payoff from being hit, as ridiculous as that might sound. And I have to tell you that that woman was probably in her 40s, and that's not uncommon. So if you're coming into it now, you're kind of realizing that, again, there's lots of ways to be codependent, that this kind of classic way of um, looking to be mistreated, not consciously, looking to be mistreated because it it's uh, confirms what we believe about ourselves in the vault, right, unconsciously. And it's called, actually, there's a, a phrase for it in psychology. It's called confirmation bias. When we look actively, actively seek out, again, not always conscious of it, we actively seek out a sort of confirming messages and deep beliefs we already have while simultaneously disregarding information that's contrary to what we believe. So all those good messages of being valuable, that why we turn our heads to compliments, because that doesn't gel with our belief system. That's why we break eye contact, change the conversation, maybe even walk away because there's like a, there's a dissonance there that all those compliments, all that good stuff doesn't jive with how I feel about myself. So, and codependence coming out of this uh, low self worth place uh, can also often be very afraid to make mistakes. This also gels beautifully with being an ACOA. It doesn't have to, but it does gel beautifully with it. Often because things happen as a kid, you know, you probably weren't allowed to make mistakes, which you're going to do, obviously. So they weren't received well. Maybe they weren't dealt with with kindness and, you know, gently and maybe some very harsh consequences. But this fear of making mistakes has us walking around on eggshells because obviously we're human and we're going to make mistakes. Uh, this and this type of low self worth is often the at the is the guts of or the the underlying geyser. I'm thinking of those geysers out west that are like under the earth. It's kind of like the geyser for perfectionism, you know, that terrified to make mistakes, and then having uh, the perfectionistic thinking that's so rigid, shoulds and ought tos, have tos, got tos, and then there's often a lot of guilt you know, involved with that. And also shame, of course, because if it's not enough to be locked into the very rigid thinking process of perfectionism, when we eventually don't check the box, reach the bar, wherever you want to say it, which is going to happen, right? If it's not enough to be trapped in this sort of excruciating cycle of self-abuse, then when we fail at whatever, right? Then all of, now we now we feel badly because we didn't measure up. And those are, of course, secondary emotions. So the shame, like I've said in you know lots of episodes for di- various different reasons, is really truly what brings us down. And without exaggeration, literally can kill us, like with depression, because it's that underlying feeling of being defective. There I go again. There goes my anxiety or the perfectionistic thing. There I go again. I couldn't even do this right. And that feeling of being flawed and defective is really, uh, you know, the spiritual and emotional equivalent of drinking turpentine for breakfast instead of OJ. This this type of codependent just does not have a shut off switch with this. They they feel very unable to stop talking and thinking and worrying about other people and their problems. Remember, this is all coming from Melody Beatty's codependent no more. So some some codependents, remember, you might have, you might check this box, that box, whatever. Some codependents are real big worriers. They worry about the you know the most minuscule things. Um, they can get very anxious about problems and people. They check on people a lot, and they often feel like they just can't find the answers. Uh, so remember that the low self worth involved here, and many codependents are afraid to let themselves be who they are. Big, big fear. I want to emphasize big fear here. They're so afraid that if they let themselves be who they are, they'll be exposed and people will see this horrible, horrible person who they believe they are and very afraid. This is often why 
They're extremely rigid and extremely controlled, and often why they try so hard to control other people. Okay, then we have a, another stereotypical way to manifest codependency. I'm thinking of Al, what was what was called Al-Anon back in the day, or um, codependency used to be called enabling. That would be this person that lands on the planet denial because it's way easier to just ignore that pink elephant with purple polka dots sitting on the couch than it is to actually, you know, confront the family ourselves and deal with, you know, deal with um, all the dysfunction and chaos going on in the family. It's much easier to just pretend like it's not there. So this is a, a classic. The um, uh, I'm thinking even, I don't know why it comes to my mind, like in the fifties with, you know, the, you know, then the wife just hiding bottles. And again, we all know it goes the other way around, right? Dad or the other mom or whatever, hiding all the bottles and covering it up and hiding everything from the kids and the neighbors and everything else. So the one who, the codependent who is a big denial person will go out of their way to ignore problems and just pretend like they aren't happening. They often try to pretend that whatever's going on isn't as bad as it really is. Lots of rationalizing. Oh, well, you know, she does work all day. She's a top tier attorney in her office. You know, don't forget she's, 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 she's supporting us guys. And, um, you know, mom deserves to have her five gin and tonics at night or whatever. They tell themselves that things will get better tomorrow. There's lots of dialogue about this will all get better. Lots of just rationalizing. They, this is another way they can stay so busy that they don't have time to think about things. I cannot tell you how much I've encountered this in my adult life. And the thing is, the, the, the people that are, I call them emotional runners, the, it's very difficult, I think, for them to come into awareness because they are so praised by society, especially in the United States, where we are gerbils on crack and we are, you know, praised for basically workaholism, right? Just running around, praise, praise, praise that, you know, she doesn't stop. And I'm a big fan of a, of a work ethic. Trust me, I'm, I'm very, very hardworking. And there's a point though, where this type of, this type of codependent is running, running around and doing, 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 doing to avoid feeling, to avoid thinking about things. So it's really just another way to numb, numb oneself out, just like any other way to numb ourselves out, you know, drinking, shopping, whatever. So the, you know, the bottom line is that somebody who's staying so busy that they don't have a minute to call their own, to stop and think and actually feel is wrestling with some codependency issues for sure. And then it's going to sound a little redundant, but there's a way to explain it. There's a codependent who, again, it's another classic stereotype um, manifest this type of dysfunction as very overt dependency. This is the person who cannot be alone. Just again, again, it can also go back to the person who allows herself to be hit with overlapping of dynamics here. There's lots of overlap with dynamics. So, and people will often stay with somebody. Uh, let's say it's not so extreme. It's not a hitting situation. Let's just say it's just a, a bad, just an unhealthy relationship. A lot of control issues, a codependency dance. And she or he or they or whoever are going to stay with this person because staying with this person uh, is way better than the excruciating thought and feeling of being alone. And because this person is so wrapped up in um, coming from this place of not valuing themselves, seeking out people who don't value them, they also often are worrying that you know no one's ever going to love them for who they are. And also wrapped up in this dynamic is, is the very sad truth. Again, we're going to talk about the awareness, so we're going to keep it positive. The codependent, especially who manifests in this way, underneath it all, does not feel lovable. They feel that they are not worthy of somebody genuinely loving them. And this can be romantically or any kind of way. They don't, they don't love themselves, and that's why. And this is because of messages way, way early on where they were met probably with some very conditional love, which isn't love, it's a, that's an oxymoron right there, right? Because genuine love isn't conditional. It's just, so what, So this, this adult, probably their inner child, was met with, I love you if, I love you if, I love you if, and I don't love you when. 
is probably what's going on with this person. So this is in the vault, and this is a big one. And uh, um, so again, praise yourself with awareness if you're coming into this right now, because with the courage and stick to itness, you can climb up and out of this. So when when the codependent is walking around, kind of emitting out of their pores, that they're not lovable. Well, guess who they're going to attract? And we talked about that seeking out messages that we already believe, and they're unconscious, right? They're, so we're seeking out people who are going to reaffirm that it's true. I'm really not worth being loved. So until we turn that around, that is going to keep happening, which then reinforces. It's like a cycle. Not, not like a cycle. It is a cycle of when we reinforce that, it then re, you know, reaffirms that we don't love ourselves. And it's just, it's a very, very vicious, bad, bad self-destructive cycle. And this, I say dependent, codependent, if you will, um, is classic because they look to relationships to provide all their good things. These are latcher honors and looking for their happiness and to be filled up, I guess is a way to say, to be filled up externally by other people in their relationships. And they center their lives around other people, especially and romantically, they would just basically put all their eggs in one basket kind of thing, getting all their feel good feelings from this person. So think about that's just kind of waiting to blow up, right? Because that's a whole lot of pressure to put on somebody. And as we know, rationally speaking, no one can make us happy but ourselves. And it's important to know that since, since um, codependents are really good at lying to themselves, and again, remember, this isn't intentional. There's just such a disconnect with the self-awareness piece. The authentic self is in the, forget the, the passenger side or even the back seat. The, the authentic self is basically in the trunk, for lack of a better way to say it. So because there's such a lack of honesty and self-awareness with themselves, um, due to fear, right, of you know yanking the blanket off, off of themselves, they don't want to, they're so afraid to see what they're going to find, they, they often walk around kind of feeling like they're going crazy and, and just unsure of why they're feeling this way. You know, this type of uh, codependent obviously has very weak boundaries. They often let other people hurt them, like we said, continue to let other people hurt them, and then they wonder why they're hurting so badly, kind of the poor me, poor me thing. Then sometimes they'll get angry and then, become totally intolerant. It kind of depends which way you go with it. And here's another overlap situation with the ACOA. So it doesn't have to be an addicted household. The dysfunction piece is probably there no matter what. But often codependents have, you know, big trust issues. And so if we think of, you know, how this could overlap with growing up in an addicted household, you know, it's not very hard, right? People develop trust issues because when you're, you're a little inner child, when you know, she was a little baby or he was a little baby. And, um, you know, then one and two and four and five and 15 and 20 or whatever, when, when we were unable to trust the people we uh, depended on, you know, it's no big surprise that, you know, we don't, we develop trust issues and we don't trust the world sometimes. So codependence often don't trust themselves. Again, we said they also don't value themselves. They're afraid to see what they really are underneath it all. So they don't trust themselves. They don't trust their own feelings, which means they often they often don't trust their own decisions, often don't trust other people, and and they can fall into this trap of trying to trust unworthy, untrustworthy people, which doesn't usually go anywhere good. Um, and uh, for those with... Uh, this is what Melanie Beatty says. Those who have um, spiritual religious beliefs often believe God has abandoned them and often lose faith in and trust in God. That's coming from Melanie Beatty again. And, you know, and, and uh, on a different note, um, again, can also definitely have some overlap with it, growing up in an addicted household. Anger, because most of us weren't able to express anger. Anger has a, has a positive role. Anger when it's healthy, you know, lets us know that somebody is violating us. And I don't mean necessarily on the far end of that spectrum. It can be, you know, violating our belief system. It can be, you know, just blatant, you know, they're in our, they're in our turf territory kind of thing. And anger says back the hell up. It's a good thing unless it's not, you know, um, processed and validated, then obviously it becomes toxic. So in the beginning, anger is a, is a protector and it's good. Uh, it, it, however, when we grew up in a dysfunctional family, we often weren't, you know, taught 
about healthy anger and only, you know, and often not allowed to express it at all. Or if we did, there were very, you know, negative and maybe severe consequences. So the co this codependent often feels very scared, hurt, and angry, often lives with people who are very scared, hurt, and angry. They're often afraid of their own anger because of, like we just said, they didn't have a good outcome. They often, this is a biggie here, they often, often think that they'll lose people if anger enters into the relationship. And because of this, it's no big surprise that the codependent represses or holds in their angry feelings. And it's also no, no big surprise that this, co this type of codependent allows themselves to be controlled by other people's anger. And a couple more overlappers here. So this can be with an addicted family or not. It's definitely also an ACOA box checker because many of us um, can, can have difficulty having fun and being spontaneous. And it's that need to have control because when we grow up in a chaotic environment, the child inherently near needs stability. And it's so it's no big surprise when they kind of fear being out of control. We can sometimes laugh when we feel like crying. And another big one is, and also an overlapper, is just staying very loyal to um, to people who don't deserve it. I guess there's no other better way to say that. This, this, you know, diehard, tenacious loyalty to people who just aren't worthy of it. So I'm feeling pretty good about this discussion. And, you know, continuing sort of from where we left off last time, with the, uh, the rescuer. And if those of you who are listening to this one and missed the, the one before this, I would strongly encourage you to go back and listen to that one because it'll be a, be a nice sort of cohesive, um, you know, discussion of what codependency is. And now what we will do is we'll kind of conclude our part two here. And the next one, we're going to talk about, um, you know, kind of becoming free from this, you know, now that we are aware of it, what do we do? And so the next one is going to be, you know, self-care specifically for the codependent person, kind of mapping out, you know, kind of the steps to take to climb up and out of this unhealthy pattern of living. So, Minecrafters, on that note, I'd like to thank all of you for listening in the United States and across the world. With a big shout out to Japan today, I'm going to give this my best shot. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing it right. So thank you, Japan, is arigato gozaimasu. And again, thank you for listening, everyone. Have a mindful day. I'm going to say, whoops, this is Kimberly Quinn signing off from Northern Vermont. Have a mindful day. <laughs>